All right, this time we will sing hymn 496, Victory in Jesus. <laughs> studies. Um, right now, we are doing our Bible studies uh, instead of Lenten services. So that means that during our Bible studies on Wednesday, we are actually studying a subject that is related to Lent. And what we're learning more about is the atonement, exactly what that means for us. And, uh, you know, we started that last week, but it's really a thing you can jump in on any time, so if you missed part of that, don't worry about it. I encourage you to come and join us. Um, it's, it's really been some good stuff we've been studying. That said, um, I have a question. How many of you have ever been locked out of, say, your cell phone or your computer or an important website because you forgot the password or something like that? Ever happened to anybody? Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few of us have had that experience. And uh, if, if maybe after some trouble you managed to finally get in, you got access back to that thing you were locked out of, did that feel pretty good? Oh, finally, I have 
access. I can get to my stuff, right? Well, many, many years ago, well, not many, many, but some years back, um, I knew a mother, and this mother had a couple sons who had muscular dystrophy. And both these sons eventually passed on, as often is the case with people who have muscular dystrophy. Um, the first one of her sons passed on at the age of 16. And when he passed away, he had a laptop. And this laptop had a lot of stuff on it that she really wished she could access and find out you know, what he had there. Um, uh, but she had no clue what his password was. She was locked out of the computer. And she asked if anybody um, knew how to get into this computer. Well, I tinker around with computers a little bit. And uh, I happen to have had some software that uh, could maybe help me get past a computer's password. So I told her, I'll, I'll give it a shot, you know. So I spent some time working on the laptop for her, and uh, eventually, thankfully, I did manage to get, get into it and uh, get her access to her son who had passed his laptop. And she was so happy that she got that access, that now she could, she could see the things that he had been writing about and stuff like that after she lost him. So sometimes, getting access to something we've been locked out of really can be a wonderful thing for us. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Now, we've been studying the Book of Romans. And the Book of Romans, we've studied the first four chapters already. And in this process, we've learned in chapter 1 that we're all sinners. And we learned in chapter 2 that we may find other ways to try and justify ourselves. Morality, religion, whatever the case may be. By the time we got around to chapters 3 and 4, we really learned that the only way was by faith. The only way to really be saved was by faith. Well, starting now in chapter 5, we're going to learn a little bit about what that looks like, how that works, why Jesus is the only way that we can gain access to the Father. Chapter 5 starts out in verse 1 saying, Therefore... What do we do when we see the word therefore? What's that supposed to cause us to think about? Well, yeah. But yeah, go back, right? Yeah. we got to go back and think about what we just learned. So we just learned that no matter how we try to square it, salvation only comes by faith. Justification only comes by faith. Ah, so, therefore, with that in mind, since we have been justified through faith, it says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have to think about first, justified. What does that mean for us, the word justified? If you've been justified by faith through Jesus Christ, it means that God sees you just as though you have never sinned at all. Isn't that an awesome thought? Because we can think of all the things we've done wrong in our lives and realize that because of Jesus, God can look at us and see us just as though we've never sinned at all. And that comes by faith. And because of that, it says... We have peace with God. This is an objective reality, my friends. We have gone from being enemies of God to being friends with God. Remember, Jesus said, 
in John 15. I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends. We are now friends with God because of Jesus. We have peace with God because of Jesus. Our verse this morning, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who does that sound like it's talking about? Jesus, right? Now this comes from the book of Isaiah. This was written down almost a thousand years before Jesus. Why do we have a passage in the Bible that seems to so clearly be talking about what Jesus did that was written that long before he even lived? God must have had something to do with that, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, a big part of that passage talks about how what he did at the cross brought us peace with God. Allowed us to go from being enemies with God to being God's friends. To having peace with God. In verse 2 it says, Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. There it is again. Access. Jesus is that forgotten password that gives us access to the Father. We've gained access to something we were locked out of, and now we stand in a privileged place in God's grace. We have direct communication now with God through Christ. We stand because we have been justified through Christ, and also because through Christ we stand in grace, because we have this high priest who intercedes for us, ongoing and ongoing. He doesn't, it doesn't have to be like it was under the old covenant, where we would continually have to go and offer sacrifices to be in God's good grace. Jesus has done it once for all. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We don't have to come to God's throne with timidity, like a bug waiting to be squashed because we've been naughty. No, we are encouraged because of Jesus to come and be welcome because we know that we will find help at the throne of God by the grace of we get through Christ. Do you understand that? We have this special privileged place now because of Jesus. You put your faith in Christ. You don't have to be afraid of God. God welcomes you because he loves you as his child. You gain that access, that reconciliation to the Father. Verse 2 goes on to say, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Why do we boast in the hope of the glory of God? Because we know that in Christ, the purpose of our lives will be fulfilled. And that will be to God's glory. You cannot fulfill your life's purpose outside of Christ. But in Christ... Your life 
its purpose will be fulfilled, and you will glorify God with your life. Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. This isn't telling us to rejoice because of suffering, but rather to rejoice in spite of suffering. We know that for us, our sufferings will work to a greater glory if we maintain our hope in Christ. Everybody's going to suffer in this life. Everybody gets trouble in this life. You can either deal with that suffering and trouble in hopelessness, or you can deal with that suffering and trouble in the hope and glory of God. That your life and your sufferings will all work to that purpose, to God's glory. And that going through those things, walking through those things with Christ will make you a better person. Will make you the person God wants you to be. Verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Some versions will say hope does not disappoint us. Because our hope is not unfounded. Rather, it's secured on the foundation of Christ and all that he has done for us. Our optimism is rooted in Christ and the promises of future glory that, again, we receive through Christ. There are no promises of future glory outside of Christ. God has proven himself dependable. He's working out his plan. Past, present, and future, we can count on all of them. We can count on his future promises because we've seen his past promises come to fruition. Just as he was dependable in the past, he will be dependable in the future. This is why it says in verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It wasn't random. This was according to God's plan. God came, sent his son to rescue the ungodly at just the right time in history, according to his plan. Why did he do that? He did that because of who he is, not because of who we are. He didn't come to rescue us because he looked at us and went, well, they're actually pretty good. They're actually pretty sweet and nice. And so, yeah, I'm going to help them out. No. There was nothing in us that should have compelled him to do us any favors. We were not worthy at all. Rather, we were desperately, hopelessly lost in rebellion. Enemies of God. And yet, Christ died for us. Why would he do that? Again, not because there was anything good in us, but rather because of his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. In verse 7 it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here the apostle seems to want to set up this contrast between different types of people. The first person in view seems to be one who is a just person but one who's not really likely to inspire others to want to die for him. You might think about a Pharisee in this case. Somebody who's trying really, really hard to be as pious as possible and, and hold up all the laws that he sees, but he's not relational to people. He doesn't give people hope and inspire them to want to lay down their lives for him. But then it goes on to talk about a good man. It says the good man 
somebody might possibly dare to die. Why? Because the good man might not be as righteous and just as pious as the just man, but he's more relational. So he's more likely to inspire others to care enough for him to maybe, maybe, lay down their lives. But then the final person in view is just this straight out ungodly person. This person who really has no redeeming merit. The kind of person you'd be like, nah, I wouldn't die for that person. Why would anybody die for that person? But this is, this is the picture that Paul is painting for us. We were like this ungodly person that nobody would really care to die for. But this is exactly the person for which Christ died. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is the way God treated us when we were his enemies. He sent his son to die for us. So much better, obviously, than anything we deserved. Yet that's what he did. If this is how God treated us when we were his enemies, how do you think he wants to treat us when we are his children? When we have that access because of Christ. When we are, I mean, God loves all the people of the world. But when people love him back, when they trust in Jesus, then they are adopted as God's children. They are granted that access. They are welcomed to the throne of God. It's a big difference. And this is why I say all the time, when we have prayer time, that God loves us and welcomes us and wants us to come to him. Because that's the reality for us who are in Christ. God loves us that way. We've been given that access. Even if we fall off the wagon, so to speak, fall back into sin for a bit, we are still reconciled to God because of Christ. <clears throat> Our reconciliation depends on Jesus, not us. Our reconciliation our fulfillment of the law, that all comes through Christ. We don't do that. Jesus did that. If it depended on what we do from day to day, we'd be in tough shape. But it depends on Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 4, Remain in me, and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That's what it's about. We are members of this most exclusive club that has the best benefits. All we have to do is keep pressing on with Jesus. Because he will lead us where we need to be. Can't do it on our own. We learned that in the first few chapters came to understand that it has to be by faith. And now we're learning that Jesus, the Son of God, is the only means by which we have this access and this special privileged place with God. And as long as we stay there, remain in Him, He will remain in us. You may struggle. You may have a hard time. But don't quit. Verse 11 says, Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In Jesus Christ, we have everything to boast about. Not because of us, but because of him. He is the author and finisher of our faith, as it says 
in Hebrews 12 too. If you're not sure that you have what it takes to keep holding on, then rest in your faith. Jesus has paid it all. Jesus has done it all. And he has fulfilled it all. Rest in your faith. It depends on him, not you. So when the devil comes around and tells you, you don't have what it takes. You can say, yeah, but Jesus does. And he's already done it. He's already accomplished it all. So I am going to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. Never underestimate the value of having been reconciled to God. As it says in Romans 8, 31b, if God is for us, who can be against us? You are a beloved child of the author and creator of the entire universe. And because of Christ, you stand holy and justified in his sight. That's where your worth comes from. Not in who you were, but in who you now are in Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus is all the difference. Jesus is the access. Jesus is our reason. Our reason to keep going. Because without him we can do nothing. Without him we are nothing. And we thank you that you knew we needed that help and you sent that help when we were at our worst. We owe you so much glory and honor and praise and gratitude. Help us, Lord, to have our hearts filled with that knowledge. In Jesus' name. If you stand with me, we'll say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time we'll sing uh, praise song 87, He is Lord. Sunday we'll have Dan Trishman here with us to speak. Uh, most likely he'll walk us through another book of the Bible as he usually does. Um, so you don't want to miss that. For now, may God our Father bless you and keep you. May you go out and live as servants of the Son, Jesus Christ. And may we all be united together in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.